can experience your subjective experience. So when a machine passes the Turing test, it will be considered conscious. Uh, tell us what is the Turing test? The, the Turing test was devised by Alan Turing in 1950. It's a way of telling whether a machine is operating at human levels, and it has really held up the test of time. Uh, you have a human judge, and there's a lot of debate as to what is a human, but uh, a human judge interviews the computer and a human uh, over what he called teletype lines. You can think of it as instant messaging. So the, the judge can't see the, the computer and the human. And he, he or she interviews the two subjects, or maybe there's five of them, and uh, asks various questions. Well, what movie have you seen recently? What did you think of the motivation of the main character? And if after some period of time, he didn't specify, but let's say a few hours, uh, the judge can't tell who the humans are and who the machines are, then we say the machine has passed the Turing test. There, there are Turing tests run every year uh, uh, among humans and com computers. And so far, no computer has passed the Turing test, but uh, they all get scores. And the humans are kind of up here, and the machines are down here. But the machines are moving up. The, the humans are kind of staying fixed. That gap is, is shrinking, according to one such test, if the com computer can p fool the judges 30% of the time, it's considered to have passed the test. In, in the last test, it uh, fooled the judges 25% of the time. I actually think 30% is too easy. I think it should be 50 or 60%. Uh, but they're getting better. And uh, by 2029, uh, I believe they will pass the Turing test, because we really will understand human intelligence. And so they will be indistinguishable from the human intelligence. But it's not going to be an alien invasion of intelligent machines to compete with us. We're going to merge with this technology, and we're going to make ourselves smarter. That's always been the, the purpose of our tools. There's uh, a lot of uh, resistance uh, to that so idea. You, you asked the question, uh, is it enough for a computer oh, to yes, pass? Yes. Is it enough for a computer to pass the Turing test to be considered yes. conscious? Uh, I would say yes. I mean, that's my philosophical belief. That's not, not a scientific demonstration. There is no scientific demonstration of the consciousness of another entity. Uh, my sort of political prediction or psychological prediction is that biological humans will come to believe that these machines are conscious. They will be convinced uh, when, when the machine says, uh, you know, I'm really happy at this, I'm angry at that, will believe that they are having that conscious experience. Just the way we don't generally believe it now when a character in a computer game, which is a computer software program, says, I'm angry, you don't really believe it yet because it doesn't have the richness of personality and the depth of language understanding that, that humans have today. That, that gap is going to go away. We, we will believe that they're conscious. And it's not going to be a clear distinction. OK, this is a machine. This is a human. You're going to have these, I mean, most biological humans will be enhanced with computer intelligence. And ultimately, they will be mostly computer intelligence. You wrote that the Earth, with the new technologies that are coming, will be able to support 10 billion people. Um, but if we are immortal, if we become immortal, we will stop reproducing? Well, we can go far beyond 10 billion. I mean, if we look uh, at the resources that humans need, uh, all of these will be provided by these exponentially growing human uh, exponentially growing information technologies. Uh, Larry Page, the co-founder of Google, and myself just did a major study for the National Academy of Engineering on Energy and identified solar energy as growing exponentially. It's been doubling every two years for the last 20 years. So it's doubled 10 times. It's only eight doublings to go uh, for it to meet 100% of the world's energy needs. And you might say, yeah, but do we have enough sunlight to go around? We have 10,000 times more than we need. We only have to capture one part in 10,000 to meet all of our energy needs. And there are very credible plans to do that over the next 20 years. Uh, the same thing is true of new emerging water technologies. There's lots of water, but most of it's either salty or, or, or polluted. But there are new technologies that are ultimately will be very inexpensive and decentralized that can clean up that water. Uh, Dean Kamen's water machine, in fact, today, uh, with some further development for just a few billion dollars, could meet all of the water needs of Africa. Uh, so these are emerging technologies. There are new food technologies that can be grown in factories, including in vitro cloning of, of animal meat without animals, uh, uh, hydroponically grown plants. 
that ultimately can provide high, very high quality organic food uh, at extremely low cost because they will be information technologies. Nanotechnology will be able to create physical products by reassembling uh, molecular fragments at very low cost. So I can email to you an information design and you can use your desktop nano factory to create a solar panel, a module for housing, all the different things that you need. Uh, then people say, ah, oh, but we don't have enough uh, land for, to support people. We actually have plenty of land. I mean, try taking a train trip across the United States or across yeah. China. Uh, it's all empty. And uh, we can, in fact, house people. If we have nanotechnology to create very efficient uh, housing uh, to support a very large number of people, so, uh, and the population's not going to grow that quickly. I mean, even if we eliminate the death rate, the doubling time of the biological population is still going to be 10 to 15 years. Uh, the doubling time of the power of these technologies is one year or less, so it'll more than be able to keep up with it. Uh, so, I mean, we can support uh, growth of the human population well through the 21st century even if we dramatically reduce the death rate and really provide actually for a very high quality of life. Because the same technologies that are going to provide uh, su substantial expansion to human longevity are also going to provide substantial expansion of resources, water, food, uh, housing, physical things that we need for our lives. So we'll keep making babies even though we are immortal, right? I mean, old methods, old technologies, linger on, they, they go into antiquity. We still have horse and buggies and mechanical typewriters and vinyl records and they don't go away instantly. Uh, we'll have other ways of reproducing ourselves, but... Uh, but what about sex? Uh, <coughs> it will be uh, separate from reproduction. Tell me about sex in the future, especially the virtual sex. Well, what is sex like today? Is it, is it only done for reproduction? Uh, you know, almost well over 99% of the sex is done for intimacy and communication, relationships, uh, sensual pleasure, uh, you know, for all kinds of reasons yeah. other than reproduction. And we've already separated, you know, to some extent the biological function from these communication, social, and sensual yeah. functions. Yeah, but, but describe so how it's going to be. Well, uh, for one thing, we'll have sex in virtual environments. Now, there's a lot of sex already in Second Life, but it uh, requires a little bit of imagination because it's really what you experience is just the sound and visual image of your avatars uh, having an interaction. Uh, 